morning, everybody. It's really nice getting to know some of you who I'm, I've never met and you keep sending me messages. It would be really nice if, you know, at the bottom of this YouTube thing that I'm putting on now, there's a little thing there that says comments. If you write a comment on there, it'll encourage somebody else to watch this video. I want to talk this morning about tempting God. Do you remember the account of Jesus being driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God to be tempted of the devil just before he started his earthly ministry? Well, this was one of Satan's temptation and the verse Jesus quoted as his answer. It's taken from Matthew chapter 4 verses 5 to 7. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down. For it's written, he shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. The actual verse that Jesus used here was from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, which says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him, in Massah. Well, how did the Israelites tempt God in Massah? Well, let's read the account. It's in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why are you chiding with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Why is it that you've brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you the elders of Israel and your rod, wherewith you smote the river, take in your hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock of Horeb, and you shall smite the rock, and shall there shall come out water from it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders and Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So why did Jesus use this scripture? Well, that closing shot from the children of Israel was, Is the Lord amongst us or not? So let's have a look at the events leading up to this incident. In Exodus 14, it tells how the Israelites miraculously crossed the Red Sea and all their Egyptian enemies who were chasing after them were drowned. Chapter 15 says they came to the waters of Marah, but the waters were too bitter to drink. So after complaining and murmuring against Moses because they were thirsty, God healed the waters and made them sweet, providing them with drink. Then chapter 16 tells how God provided the Israelites with manna, angel's food, when they complained of being hungry, promising them it would continually be there every morning for them, except the Sabbath day, of course, during their time in the wilderness. They'd always be provided with food. Now, chapter 17, the Israelites were again thirsty and accused Moses of bringing them out of Egypt just so that they could die in the wilderness. They were so angry at Moses that they were ready to stone him. God did give them water out of a rock, but Moses called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? You know, these Israelites had a cheek to say something like that. Is the Lord among us or not? That must have been so insulting for God, like slapping him in the face. After all that he'd done for them, all the miracles he'd performed to release them from the iron grip of Pharaoh. They'd been slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but now they were travelling through the desert with all the wealth of Egypt, having spoiled them before they left. 
God had bent over backwards to prove his love for these people. But now, when they were faced with an upset, a difficulty, a disappointment, they don't only grumble and complain, but they're even ready to stone Moses and go back to where they'd come from, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? (laughs) Of course he was amongst them. Any fool could see that when reading the story. A couple of years ago, I was going through a difficult time with my daughter. And during one of her intense moments, she looked at me with real rebellion and said, You've never loved me. Well, only a mother who's experienced something similar could understand how I felt at that moment. I was cut to the core. I felt as though she'd stabbed me in the heart with a knife. I couldn't even continue conversing with her and I fled the room. I bawled my eyes out for a couple of hours because of what she'd said. That's the only time she's ever made me cry. But those hurt words hurt me for weeks. What an accusation. If only she knew how much I loved her. What an accusation to say, is the Lord among us or not? Only God knew how much he loved them. Jesus would never have jumped off that pinnacle of the temple to prove whether God was with him or not. For 30 years, this man who had never sinned once had experienced such intimate relationship with God that even this his weakest moment would not let Satan get into his mind. He was hungry, yeah. He was thirsty, yeah. He was in the middle of a wilderness, yeah. But he knew God could deal with the situation just as he had done with the Israelites. And he wasn't disappointed because God sent the angels to minister to him when he'd come through his test. God has to test us to find out what's in our hearts. We would never know and neither would God know unless he allowed us to go through times of testing, disappointment, hardship. It's important for us to get these things ironed out. God can't fulfill his design for our lives unless we pass our tests. I just heard an incredible testimony of a young man who in 1971 went to preach in Vietnam and a revival broke out. He had a young interpreter also who was only 17 years old at the time. They travelled by helicopter and gunships and transport planes, sometimes by motorbikes, taking their lives in their hands. At the end of his time in Vietnam, the young preacher, who was also just 17 himself, said to his interpreter, I don't know whether I'll ever see you again, but I just want you to know that this has been a life-changing experience for me. Well, that was uh, in 71. In 1988, the preacher was in a hotel room in Vancouver, British Columbia, and he received a phone call from the young interpreter, who was at that time in California, and he said this, After you left and the Viet Cong took over, I was one of the first few they arrested because they knew I worked with the American troops as an interpreter and they knew about everything I did with you. They put me into a prison saying I was a CIA operative even though I told them I was just interpreting for them because my English was good. They wouldn't let me read anything in English, only French and Vietnamese and that was Marx and Nengel's. They were indoctrinating him with Marxism and communism with no English whatsoever and it started to get to him. Months and months went by with all the indoctrination and finally he came to the realisation that he was dumb. He didn't believe all he used to believe anymore. They'd broken him. He decided that the next morning he wouldn't pray ever again. Well, the next morning he woke up And at the appointed time, the commanding officer came to him and said, you're going to clean the latrines today. The latrines there were awful. You had to put something over your nose and mouth to try not to breathe it in. It was filthy in that prison. He started sloshing round, cleaning it. And he came to a tin that had excrement in it, which he was meant to dump. But as he was dumping it, he noticed that one of the papers looked like it was written in English. He quickly turned around, hosed it off and put it into his hip pocket. He went back to his cell and late at night when everybody was asleep, he pulled out the piece of paper whilst under his mosquito net 
and on the top right hand corner of it it read Romans chapter 8 and he start, started reading this and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God for what shall separate us from the love of God shall things present and, and so on well he burst out crying he was afraid he'd awaken everybody he cried so hard and put that paper against his face and he said God you didn't even let me go 24 hours without letting me know that you were here. He woke up the next morning and asked the commanding officer if he could clean the latrines again today. He found out that somebody had given the commanding officer a Bible and he was tearing out pieces of paper from the Bible to use as toilet paper. The young interpreter was washing them and using them for his private devotions every night. Finally, they released him. He got out. And he decided he was going to build a boat with one of the high officers helping him. And about 52 of the men were going to escape with him. It was just a matter of days before they were going to set sail when four Viet Cong came and knocked on his door. They said, are you trying to escape from here? No, he said. They said, you're telling us the truth, aren't you? And he said, yes. So they left. Well, he got on his knees saying, God, forgive me for lying. Then he prayed a prayer that he hoped would never be answered. Lord, if you really want me to tell them the truth, then let them come back again. Well, hours before they were due to depart, the Viet Cong came back, armed to the teeth, and got hold of him by his collar and he rammed him up against the wall. You're lying. You're trying to escape, aren't you? And he said, yes, with 52 others. Are you going to put me behind bars again? They said, no, we want to go with you. Four of the Fiat Kong came on board. They were on the high seas and would have capsized in a storm. But these four Viet Kong had mariner skills and took them all to safety in Thailand, where the young interpreter was allowed to be a refugee whilst on his way to the USA, which, was, which he finally reached and was able to do a business degree in management. Do you ever question in your heart, is the Lord among us or not? Well, Jesus said, it's written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. If you're following Jesus, then keep his commandments and stop that foolish questioning. Of course he's with you. He's just testing you to see whether you have faith in him. God bless you.